Oh, thank you for that uh, really warm introduction. And it's amazing to be back here. Thanks for having me. If I speak at this volume, you can hear me in the back of the room. This is a good volume to speak at. That's a thumbs up. Okay. I'll try to keep this volume up for the rest of the presentation. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for coming out and caring enough about this place that I'm coming from and the people that live there to, to come out and hear these stories. It's no small thing. Especially in these days and times, who would have thought, who would have thought that in 2017 we'd be here and Nazis would be marching in the streets of the United States? I couldn't have imagined it. Did you imagine that in 2017 Nazis would be marching in the streets, murdering people in the streets of the United States of America? That people would be marching with swastikas openly, unabashedly? I didn't. And when the President of the United States responds, he says, there's very fine people on both sides. People are taken aback by this, but what does he do? He doubles down on it. He says there's blame on both sides. And now people are, are really <laughs> concerned. And he triples down on it and he says, you got some very bad people on the other side also. So now people are really worried, you know, talking about white supremacy, getting a tailwind from the White House. And when people are starting to ask Trump, well, there's a rise in white supremacy, rise in anti-Semitism. What do you have to say about this? He says, well, you heard Netanyahu yesterday. He said, forget it. How did we come to a point where the leader of the so-called Jewish state is providing cover, diplomatic cover, political cover, for white supremacy in the White House? How do we get to this point? The truth is, we have to admit, it's a family affair. After the Charlottesville neo-Nazi march, we see Netanyahu's firstborn son, Yair, going online, writing on Facebook, the thugs of Antifa and Black Lives Matter hate my country and America too. Because of that, the leading neo-Nazi website in the world, the Daily Stormer, actually took that photograph and turned it into their banner, if you can imagine that. How did we get to this point where Israeli leaders and their progeny are providing cover for the rise of white supremacy? The truth is, it's not only the Netanyahu family that are loving off Trump. It's, uh, I have to admit, there's a great deal of support in Israel for Trump. And we see that a Pew study conducted just a little while ago found that in every country in the world, uh, people feel that the office of the U.S. presidency has deteriorated since Obama left office and Trump entered the Oval Office. But only in Russia and Israel, those are the only two countries where people feel that the presidency has actually improved since Trump took office, if you can imagine that. So Trump is elected to the presidency, and once he's president, he makes his first trip abroad outside the country. He comes to the Middle East, and he makes a stop in Israel, and he gives a speech there. And you may have seen it or heard it online, but it's unlikely that you heard any discussion of what took place right afterwards. This was only reported in Hebrew. So after Trump's speech, walking out of the speech were Natan Eshel and Ophir Akunis. These are two of Netanyahu's closest colleagues, his former chief of staff and the minister of science in the Israeli government. So they're having a conversation as they're walking out of Trump's speech. And Akunis, he says, what a speech about Trump's speech. Trump actually joined the Likud. That's Netanyahu's political party, the Likud party. He says, a wonderful correction to the Barilan speech. I have to parse this for a second. Barilan speech, what is that? It's a speech actually by Netanyahu that Netanyahu gave in 2009. Barilan is the name of a university in Israel and associated with, with the right wing. And at that point, Netanyahu was just back in the prime minister's office. He had just been elected after a decade in the opposition. He's now elected once again to be prime minister of Israel. And now, you know, everyone knows he's right wing, so they're trying to find out where he's going to go, what he's going to do, what's his vision. And he decides to make this speech and tell people, no, you need not worry. My vision for the future of Israel-Palestine is two free peoples living side by side in this small land with good relations, each with its flag, anthem, and government. So he tells the world that he supports the two-state solution. 
Okay, so back to the conversation between Ophir Akunis and Natan Eshem. So Akunis said, wow, this is a wonderful correction to the Barilan speech. And Natan Eshel responds, he says, the Barilan speech was my idea. I knew it would give us a lot of silence. I told Netanyahu, you have to either talk or act. And look how much silence that talking got us. So in other words, it was all a ruse. Okay, there, there was, it was just an effort to pull the wool over everyone's eyes. He had no intention of ever implementing a two-state solution. This was all just an effort to deceive the international community. And he did so, and it worked. And all these years, this is what's been happening, just the opposite of the two-state solution, but in fact, Israeli colonization of the West Bank, ensuring that a two-state solution can never happen. So in the Knesset just a few months ago, you have Avigdor Lieberman, the defense minister, effectively the sovereign in the West Bank. And he says to the Knesset, talking about construction of Jewish-only West Bank settlements, he says, the numbers for the first half of 2017 are the highest since 1992. So the highest in a quarter century, in 25 years, more construction than the last 25 years. This is the pace of colonization that we see. And this is what that colonization looks like. So it's a Palestinian village being destroyed, demolished, and Israeli security forces watching on guard, making sure that no one can interfere with the demolition. Of course, Palestinian people, the villagers there, having no choice but to watch their own village be destroyed. Powerless to do anything about it. This is what that looks like. Now, the thing is, these photographs that I've just shown you, they actually weren't taken in the West Bank at all. They were taken in so-called Israel proper. This isn't occupied territory. This is Israel in the pre-1967 borders. This is just down the road from where I live. This is the village of Umm al-Khiran. So these Palestinians are Palestinian citizens of Israel. So ostensibly they should have the same rights if Israel really is the only democracy in the Middle East or in the galaxy or wherever it's calling itself nowadays. You know, then these Palestinian people should have the same rights on paper as any Jewish citizen of Israel. But in fact, their village is being demolished. And a Jewish village is being built right on top of its ruins, if you can imagine that. The ultimate ethnic cleansing. Now, these people, they have no problem. They say openly, the villagers of Umm al-Khiran, they said, look, you want Jews to live in this area? We got no problem with that. We don't have problem with Jewish people. They can be our neighbors. You want to build a new neighborhood in the village? They can live right alongside us. Ahlan wa sahlan. We're totally cool with that. But the government wasn't. And the government insisted on destroying their village. And the new Jewish village that will be built on its ruins, if they're Umm al-Khiran, the Jewish village is Khiran, okay, Hebraization, Hebraization of Umm al-Khiran. So the new Jewish village, specifically in its manifesto, it says, quote, that the only people who can live there are Jewish Israeli citizens who observe the Torah according to the values of Orthodox Judaism. This is in Israel. Now, when Natan Eshel said, look how much silence that talking got us, he was absolutely right. Because let's look at the last eight years. Netanyahu in power in Israel, Obama in power in the United States, and what's happened all this time? What's Obama done about it? $38 billion, that's what he gave Israel. And that wasn't his own money. That was American taxpayer money, obviously. This is more money than any country has ever given any other country in the history of the world. But probably even more significant than the financial contributions he made were the political contributions. Now, okay, historically, every single U.S. president, going back decades, has, when the United Nations criticizes Israel for whatever actions it's taking, uh, you know, because the United States has a permanent seat on the U.N. Security Council, it can effectively veto any resolution, and it often does veto resolutions critical of Israel. Now, despite this fact, that the U.S. has given Israel diplomatic cover for decades, still every single U.S. president has at some point allowed some resolutions critical of Israel to pass in the U.N. Security Council. So from Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, all along, everyone has allowed some resolutions to pass. Only Obama, up to the very end of his presidency, allowed zero resolutions critical of Israel to pass in the U.N. Security Council. So 
all this money, all this diplomatic cover, you would think at this rate that Netanyahu would erect a statue of Obama in the middle of Tel Aviv, thanking him for being the most Zionist president of all time. I mean, that's clearly what he would have deserved from an Israeli perspective. But instead, when Obama comes to Israel, instead of a statue of him, what greets him there is this. Posters proclaiming, that, you know, with Obama in a Palestinian kafir headdress, and proclaiming that he is an anti-Semite. He hates Jews. This is what awaits him on the streets of Israel when he arrives. And, okay, sure enough, anyone can put up a poster. Anyone can go down to the print shop and put up a poster. The question is not necessarily what people on the street are doing, but in the halls of power. Well, in the halls of power, you have Ran Barat, the chief of staff of Netanyahu at that time. And he says that Obama's response to Netanyahu's speech, this is what modern anti-Semitism looks like, if you can imagine this. Now, that's from the political sphere. Let's go into the cultural sphere. All right, in the music scene. So here you have a popular singer, Mordechai Ben David. He's uh, up on stage after Obama is, you know, le he's still in office, but Trump's already been elected. So it's just those few weeks in between the two. And he says at a concert with thousands of people in the audience, in a few weeks, there will be a new president in the USA and the N-word goes home. After he says this to a crowd of thousands of people in Jerusalem, who joins him up on stage? Well, you can see him up on the, tele on the uh, jumbotron. I'll zoom in so you can have a better look. None other than Nir Barakat, the mayor of Jerusalem. And he didn't say a single word in response. But, I mean, I really shouldn't be shocked. Nir Barakat, he likes to pal around with others who aren't so fond of Obama, like this uh, man over here. This is a, a publicity photo. He's another musician or former musician, now he's more of a, a, a blogger, but at that time, he was you know, rocking stages. This is a, a popular hip-hop artist, goes by the name of The Shadow, and he's now actually joined the Likud party, just as Nir Barkat, mayor of Jerusalem, has joined Netanyahu's Likud party, so has The Shadow. And uh, after, you know, what does he have to say Obama, about Obama? The Shadow, if you can imagine this, he goes onto Facebook where he's got hundreds of thousands of Facebook followers. And he goes onto Facebook and he posts this image. Again, Obama in a kafia, holding a knife, about to stab an Israeli soldier who is standing there in prayer. Okay, with a kippah, with a skull cap and phylacteries. This is the kind of anti-Obama messaging that we see from affiliates of Israel's ruling Likud party. And again, that's like hip-hop, and we go to the pop music, and we see that uh, another quite popular singer, who not only is popular amongst the people, but also amongst the politicians. After the last election, he went up on stage with Netanyahu, sang the national anthem as they celebrated their election victory. He even does private parties for the ruling Likud party, and you know, obviously is you know, very close to Netanyahu himself. And we see that Amir Ben Ayun, he goes as far as to actually write a song about Obama, if you can imagine this. And the song he writes about Obama, these are the lyrics. I bought a crow, Obama. I named him after the president. I wish for the death of the creature. This is the kind of conversations we have about Barack Obama. Now, again, moving from that sphere, from the cultural sphere to the religious sphere, we see this man receiving a standing ovation in the Knesset, receiving the Jerusalem Prize, no less, one of the most coveted prizes in the country. And we see that he's being gifted this prize by, once again, Nir Barkat, the mayor of Jerusalem, no less. So Israel Ariel is the name of this rabbi. If you can imagine this, he's uh, not only a, a rabbi who receives large sums of money from the Israeli government to educate Israeli youth, he also fancies himself a jurist of sorts. Him and a group of rabbis, they founded uh, 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 essentially um, a kangaroo court, if you can imagine this, the Sanhedrin, and they decided to try Barack Obama in absentia for crimes against humanity, I guess, or crimes against the Jewish people. And so they hold this kangaroo court, and they charge Barack Obama, and 
Yisrael Ariel says to the crowd, if someone threatens you to ruin you, to kill you, you kill him first. If we have the might, you have to kill him if you catch Obama on the street. This is the kind of discourse we hear, not just from random people who don't have any significance, but people whose opinions matter. Why all this hate for Obama? No matter how much money he gives, no matter how much political support, just because he voices support for the idea of Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians living in peace and coming up with some kind of compromise. This is the invective hurled at him. Okay. If up until now I've been talking about how uh, people outside of Israel are spoken of for supporting a peace movement, now let's talk a little bit about how those Jewish Israelis, those few Jewish Israelis who are striving towards a peaceful resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, how they are spoken of in the Israeli discourse. So there are such people. It's not everyone who's... Uh, you know, who's supporting Netanyahu's intransigence, there are people who resist this and who speak out against this. And one of those groups is uh, called Combatants for Peace. Now, these people are Jewish citizens of Israel who served in the army and even served in its infantry, in its fighting forces, and saw battle, and after the fact came to the conclusion, yes, I did my duty, I served the state, and now I realize I was wrong. We need to change direction. We need to start working with Palestinian people. We need to come up with a way to chart a shared future together. And so they're not just talking amongst themselves about how they want peace. They're actually trying to you know, figure out what that might look like on the ground. And so they're meeting with Palestinian folk who themselves were, may have met them in battle, in fact. Palestinians who, just as these Israelis served in Israeli fighting forces in the Israeli army, we have Palestinians who served in Palestinian militant groups. And they sit together and, you know, at least this is the first baby steps towards figuring out how Jews and Arabs might be able to live as equals. Now, one of the things that they do in order to try to create a culture that's, uh, that, that, you know, a healthy peaceful culture is that on Memorial Day, you all just celebrated Memorial Day a little while ago, and so in Israel, Memorial Day is held in the springtime. And of course, historically, it's a way that people can remember the Israeli soldiers who fell in battle. So this group, Combatants for Peace, says from now on, we want to not only remember those Israelis who died in battle, but also Palestinians who died in battle, that all those who died fighting should be remembered. And I can imagine for people who lost their limbs or lost their friends um, or lost their minds on the battlefield that this is something that's uh, really a, an emotional ceremony. And so for the last few years they've been doing this, these joint Israeli-Palestinian Memorial Day ceremonies. Um, but while they're doing this, while they're coming together to try to chart a new course admirable as it is, you have hundreds of Israelis coming out to protest them, having to be held back by the police. They're screaming at the at people coming out to the service, yelling at them, swearing at them, throwing bottles of urine at them, screaming, Nazi cum guzzler, Arab fucker, may your boys be burned and your girls get raped. Go back to Auschwitz. This is the kind of rhetoric that they're met with. Now again, we're not going to pass judgment because of what, you know, people on the street, you know, there's crazy racists in every single society. Okay, fair enough. But how do Israel's politicians, its leaders, respond to this incident? So the Minister of Defense that I just spoke of earlier, Avigdor Lieberman, what does he say in response? He says, we knew how to defeat the Nazis. We will defeat the forces that act against us from within and without. So in other words, these few Jews who are trying to create peace with Palestinians, they are the new Nazis, according to Israel's defense minister. Okay, that's Israel's minister of war. What about Israel's minister of education to instruct the youth? What values will he pass on? He says in response to that incident, he goes onto Twitter and tweets, 
I expect people who mourn over baby murderers and bus bombers to be a little less sensitive to spitting and pushing. In other words, quit your whining. All right? You get what you deserve. This is Israel's education minister. Now, in response to the march, the neo-Nazi march in Charlottesville, you know, in Toronto, Canada, the town that I grew up in, you know, I, at least, you know, we saw that people were outraged by what had happened in Charlottesville, and they went out into the streets of Toronto and protested, marching down the streets with signs saying, make racists afraid again. But in Tel Aviv, where I moved to, that's not the case. In Tel Aviv, the streets are empty because it's not the racists that are afraid, it's the anti-racists that are afraid. And to give you a sense, now Netanyahu, now Naftali Bennett is talking about the values of the Jewish Home Party are leading the state of Israel today. That's his political party, even further to the right to Netanyahu. And, and I would agree. I would agree that they are the vanguard. They are the direction we're heading in. If Netanyahu's Likud party, that was bad enough. But now we are absorbing the culture of the Jewish Home Party. That's the direction we're heading in, sadly. If you can imagine this, this is just a snapshot that gives you a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, the year before last, there was a beer festival in Israel. And at this beer festival, there was a beer company, and this is how they marketed themselves, if you can imagine this. So I'll translate it from the Hebrew to English for you. Mechir HaKibush, cost of the beer is cost of the occupation. The name of the beer is apartheid. The logo of the beer, as you can see, is an image of the apartheid wall. And the slogan of the beer is Bira Koveshet, beer that conquers. So now apartheid isn't any longer something to be embarrassed about, you know. It's something to be embraced, rather. This is the new normal. Now, that's why in the last election cycle, when the Jewish Home Party ran for elections, their slogan was Mafsikim Leit Natsel, or in English, no longer apologizing. Jewish home. So if I brought you here uh, with the idea that we would talk about, up until now, Netanyahu's new normal. That's the facts on the ground. But if we want to understand where we're going, what direction we're heading in, we need to talk about Netanyahu's next normal, which is Bennett's new normal. And so for the next section of the presentation, I'm going to speak a little bit about the legislation that's on the government docket that the Jewish Home Party is introducing into the Knesset to be debated. The bills that we're looking at, the future of Israel, what's coming around the corner, up around the bend. Okay. So... The next normal, as I said, we're talking about the Jewish Home Party and their legislative agenda. So this is Moti Yogev, a legislator of the Jewish Home Party, and he says that we need to bulldoze the Supreme Court. Okay, what's this about? Why does the right wing in Israel despise the Supreme Court so much? They would say that the Supreme Court is like the last bastion of liberalism in Israel. I would disagree. That's not how I would define it. I would say rather that it's a whitewasher of the government's worst excesses, that what so often happens time and time again is that the government will propose a new law that's racist as hell. Now, the Supreme Court is put off by this. It's just so blatantly racist. They can't possibly allow this law to pass without comment. <coughs> Pardon me. So they say, all right, well, this clause, let's, let's, let's eliminate this clause. It's a little bit too racist. And this, this aspect of the law, let's curtail this a bit. And so then they, you know, they, they make some modifications and then they send it back to the legislature saying, you know, as is, it's unconstitutional. And then the government, all it does is doesn't get the message that maybe it's gone too far and it needs to pull back from the brink. No, instead, it just re-legislates the exact same law using a loophole to get around the Supreme Court you know, un, you know, Supreme Court says it's unconstitutional, they'll just get around it with a little loophole and then pass the exact same law. So whatever they wanted to do, the racist 
the, the racism they wanted to implement still happens. It just takes a few months longer than they originally anticipated. But this bothers them. The fact that they even have to wait any time until it becomes a law, until their, you know, the, their ideas are, are implemented. So now they want to neuter the Supreme Court altogether so they won't even have to wait and go through that, those hoops. Now, this isn't some kind of uh, private member's bill that is just one person, like a one-off. No, this bill is receiving support even from the Jewish Home Party chair, Shuli Mualem, and also many other religious legislators have signed on as uh, uh, all to, uh, signing on to the law as, as proponents. And it's not only the religious parties who are doing so. Also, we see at that same conference where the law was announced, we see this legislator, Nurit Koren, from the ruling Likud party, from Netanyahu's party. So this has support on, you know, from various parties that, that are factions of the government. And not only Nurit Koren, but others as well, all from the Likud party. Now, true, these were the legislators that signed the bill, that are proposing it in the parliament, but they didn't author it. They're just putting their signatures on the bill. The ones who actually authored the law, if you can imagine this, we see uh, them standing behind the podium, and you see this logo on the podium. They're the group that actually penned it. And this is the Derech Chaim movement. And they're headed by this man, Rabbi Yitzchak Ginzburg, an American rabbi of the Chabad movement. Now, who are Dere Chaim and what do they want? I actually spoke about them when I was here a couple years ago. They are a dominionist movement. And uh, just to parse that, because maybe y'all aren't necessarily familiar with that term. So a bit about Israel. You know, we, we've already said Israel wants to call itself a democracy, claims that it is one. Again, I would argue that it isn't a democracy, but rather an ethnocracy that uh, in Israel, our rights are not granted on the basis of citizenship, but rather on the basis of ethnicity. If you are the correct ethnicity, if you're Jewish, then you get the full set of rights and privileges. But if you are of another ethnicity, if you're not Jewish or less Jewish somehow, by their definition, then you receive a smaller subset of rights, fewer rights, maybe no rights, depending on who you are. So having said that, if Israel isn't a democracy, if it's an ethnocracy, for these people, that's not enough. They don't want privileges to be, you know, that's one thing for Jewish peoples to have privilege, but they want the next step. They want to take it to a theocracy where the laws of the land are the Torah and the Talmud, that it's a complete, there's no separation between synagogue and state. That's what they want to see. So this dominionist group are the ones that are actually authoring the law. Now, if you can imagine this, a couple years ago, three, four years ago, when they were having conferences, I would, to get into their conferences, to just know what's going on, what they're thinking, what they're saying, what they're planning, I would have to sneak in. I would have to like climb fences and go in the back alleys just to get into their conferences so that I could hear what they were talking about. Uh, but nowadays, there's no need to be in the shadows anymore. They're out in the open. They're partnering with the government itself. That gives you a sense of how far gone, how things have altered drastically in just a few years' time. Now, we talked about the Chaim, a little bit about Yitzchak Ginsburg, the man who heads the group. Uh, this is the religious authority behind the book, The King's Torah, Torah Tamelech. I'm sorry to talk about this again, but it's important that we know who this man is and what he's done. This book came out a few years ago, and... It's essentially a religious tract. Uh, it asks the question, the theological question, under what circumstances may a Jew kill a non-Jew? That's the thrust of the book. And the authors of the book come to the conclusion that pretty much under any circumstance, they say, quote, that there is justification for killing babies if it is clear that they will grow up to harm us, if you can imagine this. So this is the man behind legislation in the Israeli Knesset at this point, if you can imagine this. Now, these words are bad enough, but they're not just words. It's not that they have no effect. These words have meaning. They influence people, and people take those words to heart. Students of Yitzchak Ginsburg 
went out and put them into practice. They went to the West Bank village of Duma and they firebombed the home of this family and they killed this one. They actually killed a baby, a one-year-old baby boy, Ali Dawabshe, sleeping in his crib at night. His house went up in flames, burnt to a crisp. Ali Dawabshe, his four-year-old older brother, Ahmed, also was burnt from head to toe. There was no certainty. It was for quite a while, we didn't know if he was going to survive or not. He had burns over 90% of his body. He lay in the hospital suffering for a long time. Eventually, doctors thankfully were able to bring him, to nurse him back to health. And, you know, with, today, thankfully, he is back in class. I mean, he's, he's scarred over a large part of his body, but at least, you know, he's back in school. So we can say that. But despite the fact that his one-year-old brother baby brother was burned to death. His father, his mother were all burned to death. He's, the Israeli government has refused to offer compensation. They've refused to pay for his medical expenses, for everything he suffered, if you can imagine that. Now, what does Betzalel Smotrich of the Jewish Home Party, the star legislator of the Jewish Home Party, the deputy speaker of the Knesset, what does he say in response to the murder of these individuals, he says that the murder in Duma, in the village of Duma, with all its severity, is not a terror attack. Period. Terrorism, he says, is only violence carried out by an enemy within the framework of war against us. So in other words, if an Arab person kills a Jewish person, that's terrorism. If a Jewish person kills an Arab that's not terrorism, according to Bitsal Smotrich. He says those who call it terror are perverting the truth and cheapening the concept of terror. And he goes on to say, if Israel had deterred the enemy, we wouldn't have private individuals taking the law into their own hands. This is, this is how sick it gets. So he actually doesn't have a problem with this level of ultraviolence. He doesn't mind burning babies. He just doesn't want it to be privatized. He wants it to be nationalized. He doesn't want vigilante violence. He just wants those babies to be burned by the Israeli army itself, which, as we know, also happens on occasion, like these boys who were playing soccer on a beach in Gaza when Israeli jets rained missiles down on them, killing them. And I guess Betzela Smotrich wants to see more of that. So just a little bit of a insight into his way of thinking. Uh, a few months ago, you may recall, there were protests in Jerusalem when Israel established um, metal detectors at Al-Aqsa, the Muslim shrine in Jerusalem. And people resented this. It's like the one last little bit of territory that Palestinians have some level of autonomy over. So people decided to protest this by refusing to enter through the security gates, and they just had massive pray-ins in the streets of Jerusalem, where they prayed en masse in the middle of the street. So what does Betzal Smotrich do? He takes a photograph of people praying, refusing to enter the metal detectors, and he takes the photo and he slaps some text on top of it. Yavducha amim, that they shall come bending unto thee, they shall bow down at the soles of thy feet. So this is how he sees Palestinian people as his slaves. So we're talking about legislation that's coming up around the bend, right? So Smotrich, he holds a conference for his party faction, and at it he announces his decision plan. What's his decision plan? What to do about the Palestinian people? He says, we need to come up with a plan, some kind of solution. And his decision plan goes, I actually, I don't call it that, I call it the ABC plan, the Apartheid Bribe Cleanse Plan. Now, what, what does that mean? This, this is the crux of his proposal. He says, we're going to go to the Palestinian people, and we're going to say, First off, bribe. We'll, if you agree to leave the country and never come back, we'll give you a chunk of change. Here's money. Leave Palestine. You, you take that offer? Great. Problem solved. You don't? You want to stay in the land? Okay. We move to the next option. After bribe comes apartheid. You don't want to take the bribe? You want to stay in the land? Okay, fine. But understand that you're going to be living under apartheid. No more, none of this uh, temporary occupation. I mean, we've been going over 50 years of Israel's occupation of the West Bank. No one in their right mind thinks it's temporary anymore. But let's say now, Betzalel Smotrich is going to openly admit it and say it outright. 
this is permanent. You will have a lower status by law. Okay? If you want to stay in the country, these are the conditions you have to accept. You don't want a bribe. You don't agree to leave the country. You don't agree to have a lower status, stay in the country with a lower status. Then the next option is cleansing, that we'll ethnically cleanse you by force. We will force you out of the country physically. So this is the ABC plan. And again, just so you don't think it's some kind of one-off, that he did this out of his own accord and didn't have any support. No, at that conference where he announced the plan publicly, Netanyahu himself sent a video message greeting everyone there, effectively endorsing it. So this is the kind of discourse we see coming from the government, now openly flirting with ethnic cleansing. At that last uh, series of protests when people were protesting outside Al-Aqsa, one of Netanyahu's minister, Sakhya Negbi, actually had the audacity to say, if you can imagine this, posting it on Facebook, remember 48, remember 67. When you want to stop, it'll be too late. It'll already be after the third Nakba. This is where we're at today. This is Israel in 2017. So... Okay, so while this is happening, while we are swiftly descending into insanity and the government is openly flirting with the idea of outright ethnic cleansing, where are the U.S. Jewish groups? Where are those who claim to speak in the name of American Jews, who have of course never been elected by us, but who say that they are the representatives of Jewish people, where is their, if they supposedly oppose racism, where are their voices now, needed more than ever? Well, there's a group called the Simon Wiesenthal Center. They name themselves after this Nazi hunter, and they claim to oppose racism, to police racism, in fact. And what do they do when we have the largest increase in anti-Semitism in decades when you have Nazis openly marching in the streets of the United States and receiving tailwind from the White House, what do they do in response? No, they don't condemn Trump. Instead, they endorse him. They were the only Jewish group who actually came out to the inauguration and gave him a blessing, a benediction, if you can imagine that. Well, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, every year they issue their top, top 10, bottom 10, whatever you want to call it, their kill a Jew list, I guess, their list of the 10 worst incidences of anti-Semitism in the world that year, in the previous year. So this is last year's list. Take a wild guess. Who do you think they ranked as the number one anti-Semite in the world last year? Well, I, it seems I can't... <laughs> You guys have already gotten the picture. You know where we're going. Yes, number one, biggest anti-Semite, Obama and the United Nations. All right, double whammy. Number two, any ideas? The UK Labour Party. Labour Party in England. Number three, France, like the entire country of France. Okay. Number four, biggest anti-Semite in the world, BDS, okay, the Boycott Divestment Sanctions Movement. And number five, only number five, actual Nazis. So th this is how skewed their, their sense is of, of what's anti-Semitic and what's not anti-Semitic. These are the people that supposedly claim for themselves the right to determine this. Now, again, they, as I said, they do this every year. This is, in 20, this, is this past year. Two years previous, they had also issued their list. And that year, actually, there was a horrific incident of anti-Semitism. This man, an American citizen, he walked into a Jewish community center in St. Louis, Missouri, with a machine gun, and he actually mowed down uh, people. He, he murdered three people there. And, uh, you know, he, he wasn't embarrassed about it. He wasn't trying to hide it. He said outright, I wanted to make damn sure I killed some Jews before I died. So no question about his actions or his motives. Even when he got to court, he gave the Sieg Heil, the Heil Hitler salute. 
So if you can imagine, this man, according to the Simon Wiesenthal Center, merited the number seven ranking of world's biggest anti-Semites that year. Uh, that, he was number seven. The number four biggest anti-Semite in the world, according to Simon Wiesenthal Center, was this man, the man speaking to you right now. And how the hell did that happen? Um, if you can imagine this, just days after they announced you know, the worst examples of the, the, the evilest people on the planet, and they then had a gala dinner to celebrate who the people they say are the greatest people on the planet, the biggest humanitarians. And the person they named their humanitarian of the year that year was none other than this man, Harvey Weinstein. This man who has now been accused of sexual harassment, sexual assault, and rape by... Are we still on double digits, or have we now reached triple digits? That's, I, th I thought we were already at 90, but I could be wrong. But in any case, dozens and dozens of women accusing him um, of sex crimes. This is the man who the Simon Wiesenthal Center saw as their greatest humanitarian, of course, only because he donated some money to them. Um, now, when he was receiving his award, he uh, gave a little speech there, and what he said was, we are going to have to get as organized as the mafia. There's got to be a way to fight back. We better stand up and kick these guys in the ass, talking about these people that the Simon Wiesenthal Center says are the world's biggest anti-Semites, including me. So I'm just, tr I'm just trying to get this straight. So are you saying you're going to cut my ear off like in Reservoir Dogs, or are you going to gouge my eyeballs out like in your film Kill Bill, or, or do you have plans to bash my head in like in Glorious Bastards? How did we get to the point where the most powerful man in Hollywood is threatening me with physical violence? Um, what it, I actually, you know, I was kind of dumbfounded by all this and then poking around I realized that it had actually started several months earlier when I was in the U.S. Uh, giving lectures just like this. Um, then I was speaking at Harvard Law and then at that very moment this group, Im Tirzu, uh, a fascist Israeli group, and okay, look, we have this tendency on the left to call anyone to the right of us fascist, I'll, I'll admit, but this group actually is fascist. Um, after they, um, there was a group of Israeli leftists who um, parodied them, parodied them, and they uh, started a web page on Facebook, Im Tirzu Tnoa Fascistit Ziesh, translated into English, is Im Tirzu a fascist movement? It is. So they posted this on Facebook, and then the group Im Tirzu was outraged. How dare you call us fascists? We're no fascists. And they sued them for libel, saying, you've libeled us by saying this. It got to court, and the Israeli judge said, well, you kind of are fascist. And so he dismissed the suit. So even by an Israeli standard, they are actually fascists. So this group, Im Tirzu, they issued this report. At that moment that I'm in the US giving lectures, they issued this report, March 2014, and the report lists um, the, a group of Israeli, these uh, 10 or 12 Israelis who at that time were in the United States speaking about what's happening back in Israel, kind of the whistleblowers, those Israelis speaking out critically against the government. And so it lists me there, and uh, there's a little dossier on me, you know, these McCarthyist tactics trying to um, vilify us. So they write about me. David Cheney was an editor and reporter at Haaretz. That's, that's true. Uh, David Sheen, he authored this report to the United Nations about Israel's treatment of African refugees. That's also true. And then they write, you know, why is David Sheen such an anti-Semite? Because on his website, he has this graphic comparing Eli Shai, an Israeli minister, and Adolf Hitler. So, okay, first of all, I didn't call anyone a soup Nazi. I didn't call anyone a feminazi or a grammar Nazi. Uh, and I also didn't quote anything out of context. This is an actual quote from Hitler from the New York newspaper, the Staatszeitung, which was the largest German language newspaper published in New York City at that time in 1933. Hitler came to America on a visit and gave an interview to this German language newspaper. And this is what he said. We'll look at the original in Hebrew or in English. And I'll zoom in so you can see it. This is, quote, I ask the American people, are you prepared to receive in your midst these well poisoners of the German people and the universal spirit of Christianity. We would willingly give every one of them a free steamer ticket and a 1,000 mark note for traveling expenses if we could get rid of them. That's Hitler in 1933. 
Now, Interior Minister Eli Shai in 2012. Why don't the bleeding hearts criticizing me take dozens of infiltrators and settle them in their neighborhoods? Whoever comes to the immigration offices will receive a plane ticket and a stipend of 1,000 euros, with which they can live in their country for a long time. Whoever doesn't come will be caught, jailed, and deported with no stipend. So, saying that this group of people they are of a different ethnicity, that we hate them and we want them gone, and we are willing to buy them a ticket to get out the country, and even down to the same number, the same, the same financial figure of what he's willing to bribe them to leave the country. Now, the difference is that these things actually came true. Eli Shai didn't just say these words, he actually put them into practice. They tried to smear me, saying, oh, David Sheen, how could you make this comparison? How could you be so critical? It wasn't just words. He then put it into practice. He proposed this policy. The government accepted it. They implemented it. In the policy, he writes, Rikuz kolomistaninim. They're not even embarrassed anymore to use the same language. Concentration of all the infiltrators. And sure enough, in the last five years since this report was established, they carried out the policy, which was to round African refugees, that's the group he was talking about, to round thousands of African refugees into these detention centers, the largest detention center of its kind in the world, I should add, and with the objective of making their lives miserable. Making their lives so miserable that realizing, well, I guess I'd rather die on my feet and live on my knees. And with no other option, many thousands, tens of thousands of African refugees since had felt that they had no choice and accepted this bursary and left the country, went back to Africa, and then became refugees once again and had to flee for their lives all over again. And in this way, Netanyahu has ethnically cleansed between a third and almost a half of the African refugee population of the country. People weren't listening to me anymore because now D David Sheen's an anti-Semite, so let's not hear what he has to say. And so they, got, they achieved their objective. The Im Tir Tzu group got their objective. People weren't listening to David Sheen. And all these five years, in the last five years, Israel's been ethnically cleansing the country of African refugees, and no one was paying attention. The media wasn't doing its job. And, and that group that, that authored that report, the whole, it's not that they were neutral standing on the side or something. The whole time, they've been... <laughs> demanding that the Africans be ethnically cleansed. They've been protesting, as is, you know, I photographed the, the author of that report at one of these anti-African race rallies, you know, and, and this is what, what they've been doing. They've been demanding that the government uh, kick out black folks, and they have. They've, they've listened to them, and they've, they've uh, you know, done what they've asked. And these groups are, are super tight with Netanyahu. Like, they're hand in glove. It's not that they're acting independently. They're gongos, government-organized NGOs. And these groups, they persecute Africans in the street to make their lives so miserable that they eventually feel there's no choice but to, but to leave. Um, again, in the new normal, right, when the mask falls, Netanyahu now meets with them openly, publicly, you know, even invites them into his government meetings, these ultra-racists. And so now, um, if you can imagine this, Netanyahu said, okay, well, five years, we've managed to ethnically cleanse these 25,000 African refugees. Now, from now on, we're not even going to bribe them. We're not even going to offer them money to go. We're not even going to immiserate them so that they give up and go. From now on, we're just going to kick them out. This is the new normal. So, um, you know, the whole, the whole thing was, um, you know, they said that I was an anti-Semite. And so because that year I spoke at the Bundestag, the German par I was invited to speak in the German parliament. So because this man, David Sheen, who is a Jew hater, spoke in the German parliament, that was the biggest or fourth biggest anti-Semitic incident of the year, they wrote. Okay. But it's instructive to listen to what I said in the Bundestag. Of course, it was videotaped. It's all online and YouTube. You can just search for it and find out. And hear what I had to say. And I stand behind every word I said there. And essentially, what, what happened was German legislators, they, you know, they heard a, some kind of a similar presentation from me talking about racism in Israeli society. And then they asked me afterwards, what can we do about this? We want to help make peace possible between Israelis and Palestinians. How can we do so? You know, we're talking to the Labour Party, and, and I'm like, well, well, that's your problem. You're talking to the Labour Party. Um, there's virtually no difference between Labour and Likud. You know, it's merely a matter of lip service, perhaps. But 
In practice, their policies are nearly identical. And instead of just talking to the religious, uh, religious Zionists and the secular Zionists and the, the, and the liberal Zionists, you need to start talking to the non-Zionists. No, don't only speak to the Zionists, okay? And start speaking to the Palestinian parties. Start speaking to the Palestinian politicians and parliamentarians and hear what they have to say. And I'm not saying that they were waiting on my every word or anything, but just so happens that half a year after I made that speech, the German foreign minister made an official state visit to the country, and he actually had a public meeting with the head of the Palestinian party in the Israeli Knesset, with Ayman Odeh. So, I'm glad something I said got through. Um, that was a few years ago. Now, bringing you up to speed in just the past year, again, that was a changing of the guard. The new German foreign minister comes to the country, and naturally, uh, while, while in the country, he meets with the president, but keep in mind in Israel the presidency is only a ceremonial position. They have no actual power. Um, well, what about Netanyahu? No, Netanyahu refused. <laughs> he refused to meet with the German foreign minister. Wow, that's pretty scandalous. Why would he do such a thing? Well, um, he, he, it, it wasn't so hard to discern. He, he made some public commentary on the matter. He said, Europe has to decide if it wants to live and thrive or if it wants to shrivel and disappear. So Netanyahu is like openly threatening the destruction of Europe now. And why is he doing this? What, what crimes have the Europeans committed? He says that the EU is the only association of countries in the world that conditions relations with Israel on political conditions. So he's saying, I'm happy to take your money, I'm happy to do business with you, Keep your opinions to yourself. I don't want to hear it. You're going to criticize our human rights record? You know, shut up. I, I, you know, that, that's, that's, that's my limit. And, and then, of course, that's, what happened was that the German foreign minister, in addition to his planned meetings with the Israeli government officials, he had also scheduled meetings with Israeli human rights groups. Those very groups like B'Tselem and like Breaking the Silence that are the whistleblowers of Jewish-Israeli society, who report on Israel's crimes against the Palestinian people and the violation of their rights. So because the German foreign minister had also scheduled during his time in Israel meetings with these groups, Netanyahu outraged, canceled his meetings. And his foreign minister, Tsipi Chotovelli, explained it in greater detail. She said at that time that we face one enemy called Hamas and a second enemy that is those organizations, meaning breaking the silence and B'Tselem. So she's equating them, putting them on par. This is how peace groups are spoken of in the Israeli discourse, how the government incites against those few Jewish Israelis who actually strive for coexistence. And that's, you know, up until now we've been talking about what happens when Germany comes to Israel. What happens when Israel goes to Germany? At the Israeli embassy in Berlin, they hold, a couple years ago, they held a um, press, uh, you know, a meeting for Israeli journalists stationed in Germany. And the press officer, you know, said to the Israeli journalists straight up that we are working to preserve the German guilt. Israel has no interest in normalization of relations between the two countries. Wow. So even till this day, 2017, the Israeli government does not want Germany to rejoin the family of nations. It wants to frame it as eternal, eternally Nazi, forever. Why? We see that this isn't, it, it's, it runs from the top, but it goes down to every level of government. So even at a local level, you have a, 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 a regional council using my tax money. Yeah, I'll, I'll translate it. Of course, this is in Hebrew, but I'll, I'll turn it into English for your benefit. So this is an animation, animated movie that the, an Israeli uh, local council pay for with my tax money, from our tax money, to create this. Now, on the left, you see the logos of all those peace groups, like Peace Now, B'Tselem, Breaking the Silence. And they write, this is the tag, this is the final frame of the, of the animation they write. Europeans might seem different to you now, but you look exactly the same to them. So again, parsing it for you, the meaning is, 
those Europeans, you peace groups, you're preparing dossiers on the uh, you know, discrimination and, and the violation of Palestinian civil rights and human rights, and you're passing them on to these European governments. Those European governments are as Nazi as they ever were. They were Nazi then, they're Nazi now. And you, for passing this information along to them, you are Nazi collaborators, you are Kapos, and you will suffer the same fate. You will be hung. This is my tax, this is what my tax money goes to, right? So what's it about? Why is the Israeli government trying to frame Germany as still Nazi till this day, when in fact today, Germany is like BFF with Israel, you know, they're like best buddies, super friends, and as Zionist as they get. You know, but still, Netanyahu is still trying to make Merkel out to be <coughs> Hitler personified. What's this about? Now, the truth is that Netanyahu, he doesn't only slur Germans as eternal Nazis. He plays pretty fast and loose with that term, to be honest. A couple years ago, he said, as the Nazis strive to create a master race while destroying the Jewish people, so is Iran. Now, you know, I'm, I've never been to Iran, I don't speak Farsi, I, don't, I can't say that I'm you know, well acquainted with what's going on there from up close, but I, you know, I'm, no, I'm no fan of the Iranian regime, but uh, they happen to have the largest population of Jews outside of Israel. In the Middle East, there's more Jews in Iran than any other country besides Israel. There's tens of thousands of Jews living there, and they have the right to leave the country at any time and move to Israel anywhere else they want, and they don't take that option. So if they are in fact trying to destroy the Jewish people, they're doing a very poor job of it. Um, no, it's not about that. And it's not only Iranians, it's also Palestinians, if you can imagine this. Last year Netanyahu said Hitler didn't want to exterminate the Jews at the time, he wanted to expel the Jew. And Haj Amin al-Husseini, a Palestinian religious leader, went to Hitler and said, if you expel them, they'll all come here. So now Netanyahu, in his efforts to slag anyone he doesn't like, Palestinian people, as the new Nazis, he's willing to even exonerate Hitler. He's whitewashing Adolf Hitler himself, saying Hitler didn't come up with a plan for genocide, Hitler just wanted to deport the Jews. It's only once Palestinian people spoke to him and convinced him that he had to carry out the final solution. This is the extent. He's willing to be a Holocaust revisionist in his effort to smear his enemies as, not, as new Nazis. And, uh, I mean, that's today. 20 years ago, he wasn't as bold about it. Uh, at that time, Israel, Netanyahu was the leader of the opposition. The prime minister of Israel at that time was Yitzhak Rabin. And, you know, at that time, he didn't himself make the Nazi accusation. He just let his rank and file do so and didn't say anything to stop it. So, at that point, when, of course, lots of problems with it, but because of the Oslo peace process, um, there, were, there was an effort to at least move in a direction of perhaps Palestinian people achieving some sense of, of, uh, you know, of achieving at least some of their rights with all its imperfections. But at that time, um, you know, this was, it so aggravated the right wing in Israel that they started producing posters of Prime Minister Rabin in Nazi regalia. Now, I'm not putting that on Netanyahu himself, but the right wing held rallies in public squares, you know, against the government, against Rabin, and at these massive rallies, you know, there were, Netanyahu would stand up on the balconies, and there were plenty of people, and he would give speeches to the people, you know, assembled below, and there were people in the audience who were screaming death to Rabin, holding up photos of him in SS uniform, and other members of the government heard and were disgusted by it and left the stage and walked away because they didn't want to be associated, but not Netanyahu. Netanyahu stayed there and he riled up the crowd, even though they were, you know, saying Rabin is a Nazi. And as we know what happened in the weeks and months to come, he was assassinated by a right-wing Israeli Jew. So Netanyahu plays fast and loose, but let's be honest, okay? He's not the first Israeli prime minister to do so. Um, even Israel's first prime minister, it's not only from the right to the left, it's also from the left to the right. So the head of Israel's Labour Party, David Ben-Gurion, he 
had no problem also accusing his ideological rival of Nazism. He said about Vladimir Jabotinsky, who was the founder of what became the Likud party, Netanyahu's party. But he, Ben Gurion said of Jabotinsky, he called him Vladimir Hitler. And he said, we must not minimize the danger of Hitlerism in the Hebrew settlement. Went on to say this also about his protege, the next leader of the Likud party, the man who went on to become the first Likud prime minister of Israel, Menachem Begin. Ben Gurion said, Begin is a distinct Hitlerist type, racist, ready to annihilate all the Arabs. And Begin will replace the army and police headquarters with his goons and rule as Hitler did in Germany. Okay, that's then. But we see that this continues even till today. I guess uh, one of the most uh, enthusiastic users of you know, Nazi lingo is Israel Eichler. He has said, like, he just like, left, right, center. He's, like, he's got no problem with it. Um, it, it. From his perspective, it's secular Jews that treat religious Jews as Nazis once treated Jews. And you know, he, he drops this on the regular. So in one speech in the Knesset, he actually said, called people Nazis, neo-Nazis, Israeli Nazis, and members of a Nazi underground in a single speech. Now, when we see photographs like this, you know, images of young children being forced to wear these uniforms and yellow stars, of course, you know, it's triggering. You know, who isn't affected? Who isn't, you know, touched? But these photographs were not taken 75 years ago in Nazi Germany. They were taken in Israel just a few weeks ago. Okay, how is that possible? They were taken at a protest by ultra-Orthodox Jews, a demonstration. Now, why would that be the case? Because, you know, up until now, for all these years, the government of Israel has required a conscription of all its Jewish Israeli citizens. It drafts all Jewish people into the army, but it gives an exemption to ultra-Orthodox Jews. That's been the case up until now. Now the government is saying no more. From now on, ultra-Orthodox Jews will also have to serve in the Israeli army. So because these ultra-Orthodox Jews resist this, not because they're big peaceniks and because they love Palestinians or anything like that, but just, I didn't have to do this till now. Why should I have to do this now? I don't want to go to the army. I want to continue to do what I'm doing. So they are resisting the draft, and they're saying the fact that you're drafting us is so evil that it's as evil as the Nazis treated the Jews. That's how aggrieved we are, they're saying. They're comparing them. They've got a kid dressed up like this young boy from this iconic photograph of the Holocaust. Now, just as in Israel, it's you know, par for the course to utilize that iconography to make an anti-army statement, in Israel, one can also use that iconography to make a pro-army statement. So here is a political cartoon published in an Israeli newspaper or it's really online news site. And so in frame one, you have poor Jewish boy under the gun of a Nazi. And in the second frame, you have a fully armed Israeli soldier. And why, how is he being aggrieved? He's being shown a piece of paper that translated says, rules for live fire. What does this mean? Again, I have to parse this. Um, so you may recall uh, a year ago, that uh, an Israeli soldier shot a Palestinian man while he was lying on the ground. He was injured, he was immobilized, he couldn't do anything, but that soldier decided he wanted to kill him, and so he did. It happens all the time, but in that specific incident, instance, rather, um, it was filmed. A Palestinian man had caught it on camera, and because of that, it went public, and so, left with no other choice, the government was forced to put him on trial. But the discourse in Israel is, how dare you restrict who an Israeli soldier can shoot and who he can't shoot, and when he can shoot and when he can't shoot. You're saying that only under certain circumstances there's rules for live fire? There's rules that we must follow of when we're allowed to fire and when we're not allowed to fire. And that is, so, that is as oppressive as the Nazis on the Jews. That's how aggrieved the poor Israeli soldier is. Obviously, 
this man received a lot, a lot of support from the Israeli population and sad to say for doing what he did. Now, I, I, it behooves me to mention that uh, you know, some of the people protesting in Israel using iconography of that infamous photo of the young boy in the Holocaust actually have every right to do so. I'm talking about actual Holocaust survivors themselves. Uh, in Israel, in recent years, we see this increasing phenomenon of Holocaust survivors actually having to protest because over a third of them live in poverty, even after everything they went through. They suffered through the Holocaust, they survived, they managed to make it to Israel, they've been living in Israel, now they're like at the very end of their lives, and even at the end of their lives, they have to wonder, am I going to eat meat this week, or am I going to pay for my groceries, or am I going to be able to afford medicine, or can I heat the house? Why should you have to think, why should anyone have to think, but certainly why do people who went through such suffering have to make these mental calculations that, you know, as their octogenarians? They shouldn't have to, but, you know, the government has consistently failed to do anything about this and provide enough funds for them. So, <laughs> sickeningly, you actually have Holocaust survivors using the same imagery, saying, you know, we are agreed. Now, how, the problem is that people see this iconic image and they see themselves in it. And of course, who can't sympathize with a boy who suffered in the Holocaust? But the idea, what, what's happened is that Israeli people see themselves as embodying that to this day. They see themselves as, li as, as living uh, you know, manifestations of this. So they see, instead of you know, this image, what's actually happening is they are now, Israel is now obviously a Middle East superpower. Okay, it's a regional superpower. It's got a nuclear armament. Uh, it's, there's no army in the Middle East that can possibly hold a candle to it. Yet, with all this military might, Israeli people still see themselves not as this gargantuan in power in the region, but instead still as this little boy, powerless, unable to defend itself. So, how is Holocaust discussed in Israel? This is a member of the government, a minister, the deputy defense minister. Now, recently he said, a couple years ago he said, they are a silent Holocaust. Take a gander, take a guess. What do you think he might be talking about when he says they? Are a silent Holocaust. Any ideas, anyone? I'll give you a hint. How's that? This is what he was talking about. Miscegenation. Okay. The idea of romantic relationships between Jewish people and non-Jewish people. And that, to him, is a silent Holocaust. Okay. The most beautiful, I mean, look, this is uh, Mahmoud and Moral, the son of Muslim citizens, the daughter of Jewish citizens. I don't say he's Muslim or she's Jewish because no one ever quizzed them on their spiritual beliefs. No one asked them, do you worship Allah? Do you pray to Yahweh or Buddha or anyone else? Like, no one ever, there's no religious test. It's all racially defined. His parents are registered as Muslim. Her parents are registered as Jewish. For that reason, they're not allowed to marry. Israel only allows marriage between Jews, and it's not exact, it's not, or, or between Muslims, and it's not accidental. It's on purpose in order to perpetrate, and you know, to to uh, ensure that racial separation continues indefinitely. So, what should be the most beautiful thing, star-crossed lovers, Romeo and Juliet, is defined by the government as silent Holocaust, equivalent to the genocide of six million Jews. This, this is what we hear from Elie Ben Dahan. Now. At their now, of course, they, they had a wedding party to celebrate their union. They weren't going to let all this hate break them up, and so they had a, a party. And at that party, at, again, I filmed this as well, and you're welcome to look at my YouTube channel and watch the video on your own. You had hundreds of Israeli Jews outside the wedding hall screaming, chanting, death to the Arabs. And you see them carrying this sign at that protest, and I've translated it again, intermarriage is a holocaust for the Jewish people. Now, the, the, it gets sicker, actually, because if you can imagine, and this is a sign they had at the, at, the, at the protest, but at that very protest, the spokesperson of the group, of this anti miscegenation group, he was actually quoted by the Israeli newspaper Ma'ariv as saying, Hitler was right, 
but about the wrong nation. We are the chosen race. So not only, on one hand, adopting, you know, take transposing the Nazi story and saying we are the Jews in that story, we are as aggrieved as the Jews are, but simultaneously saying we are the Nazis in that story. This is how sick. And sadly, it's not the only incident. Um, we see this often um, at soccer games, for example, in Israel, where you know, in a soccer stadium, you'll see graffiti that says, uh, Maccabi to Auschwitz, Maccabi go to Auschwitz. The opposing soccer team, you deserve to go to Auschwitz. If you can remember, this is in Hebrew, right, in Israel. In soccer stadiums, and again, it's not just a one-off. Here you have, in the crowd, masses of people. It's not just one person writing on the wall. There's like a banner that takes up dozens of people carrying it that says, again, Maccabi la Masrefa, Maccabi to the crematorium. Okay? You even, of course, have uh, soccer, uh, the captain of the Beersheba youth soccer team, who wrote on his Facebook, wipe all the pathetic leftists out of the country, leftists to the gas chambers. So, so this discourse of not only saying we are as aggrieved as the Jews are by the Nazis, but also we will be as vicious as the Nazis were to the Jews in order to <coughs> smite you, our enemies. This discourse is part of the of commonplace discourse in Israel. And this is why um, the director of education at Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust, National Holocaust Memorial, he said this past year, he said, what people don't realize is that Holocaust awareness is very different from Holocaust knowledge. Just because the Holocaust seems to be everywhere in the public sphere in Israel, Okay? It doesn't mean people are widely educated about it. Nowadays, more and more groups need to get the basic story from us because they are simply not coming with it. How is this possible? Okay? Now, even Israeli kindergartners are learning about the Holocaust. If you can imagine, this is a photograph from last year where a teacher imposed upon the kindergarten kids to wear yellow stars, like as if this is age appropriate to get them learning about the Holocaust. So, but even though the Israeli education system inculcates them from the earliest age to, to learn about the Holocaust, doesn't mean they get it, doesn't mean they understand it, doesn't mean they, they, they know its significance, and, and the reason is because of how it's taught. So this is, again, that's kindergarten now, a few years later you're in grade school, this is a grade two or second grade assignment where the teacher assigns questions about the Holocaust, why did the Germans kill the Jews? And the response from this second grade student, for which they received full marks, was because the Jewish people are the chosen people, the non-Jews are jealous of us and want to kill us. This is the message from the government, not never again to anyone. They are weaponizing this history and using it to instruct the youth with the overarching message of never again for us. As for everyone else, they're on their own. And because of this, they do not teach that, yes, as sickening and sad as the Nazi Holocaust was, and it's a horrible tragedy to us and to the world, but let's face it, there are other genocides that we also need to know about and realize that this is, did not only ever happen to us. Ten years before the Nazi Holocaust, six million Ukrainians were murdered by the Soviet Union. The previous century, 12 million African folk were murdered in the Belgian Congo. Besides all of the evils of slavery in this country, there's also the Middle Passage, where just kidnapping and transporting black folk from Africa to America, as many as 50 million people died in the Middle Passage. And that's not even to talk about the genocide of the First Nations people of this continent, in Turtle Island, North and South America, up to 100 million indigenous folk were genocided right here. It's not a competition for who suffered the worst, but let's remember that genocide is something that sickeningly, sadly, has happened many times in human history, and if we forget that, we're doomed to repeat it. Now, we're still left 
with the overarching question of what do we do about it? How can we talk about Israel? How can we criticize it and still have people hear what we have to say? You know, I didn't really have a handle on how to talk about it. Um, because, you know, obviously when I made that comparison between Eli Shai and Adolf Hitler and the quotes attributed to them, you know, it, it triggered some people, how, including those people that wrote about me, how dare you put them in the same phrase, speak of them in the same sentence. Um, but as things get worse and worse in the country and people speak openly of ethnic cleansing, then you know, what language do we have? What tools do I have to, 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 to discuss it with? And I didn't know really how to resolve this. And it was only when I uh, went to South Africa, I did a talk in South Africa in 2010, that something became clear to me. And, and I'll share that with you. And maybe it will provide a way to, to move forward. Um, so when I was in the South, I don't know if any of you have been to Johannesburg. Um, I highly recommend that you check out the Apartheid Museum. It's an excellent museum. Um, but there's one specific aspect of it that really stood out for me. It's close to the entrance. There's a wall there with these plaques, a series of plaques, 121 plaques. And in, on each of them is inscribed, as you see, the Criminal Procedure Act, the, this act, a list of all the different apartheid laws. Apartheid laws, plural. For some reason, it didn't, you know, I, I never conceived of it in that way. I guess I just assumed that it was one big law. This is the apartheid law and we passed it in Parliament and now it's official. I didn't realize that it was essentially a fabric, a matrix of many laws, uh, over a hundred laws, that together, all together, made up uh, the apartheid regime. And once I realized that, well, then I realized that we could. Can we, can we call Israel an apartheid state? Personally, I'm not invested in that argument. Are we allowed to call Israel apartheid or is that beyond the pale? You know, is it too offensive to use that, that verbal coupling? Well, for those people, I'm not really interested in parsing, you know, in coming to a con definitive conclusion, but for those people who are and want to know, is Israel apartheid or is it not apartheid? Here you are, you can create a scales of apartheid. Look at that list, 121 laws, okay? 121 laws on the books. And just compare and contrast, look at the Israeli legislation and see how many of these apartheid laws have their parallels in the Israeli context. Is it 30? Is it 50? Is it 70? I don't know. I haven't done the math. I invite anyone who's interested to calculate and then assign Israel a score. Determine what's its apartheid score. And in some ways, we can do the same thing with Nazism. Um, I, some of you have maybe seen this countdown clock. It's a nuclear countdown clock started back in the 50s when scientists realized that because of the Cold War we were, close, we were coming ever closer to what potentially could be a global apocalypse. Um, seemingly in recent weeks, uh, you know, Trump is edging us even closer to that potential reality. So these scientists got together and they created this atomic clock. The idea is that the hand of the clock shows how close we are to obliterating ourselves, okay? As the minute hand approaches the 12 o'clock mark, it means that we are getting one step closer to our own annihilation, okay? And in this way, these scientists could give us a visual reminder of how dangerously close we are to our destruction. And so perhaps, potentially we could do something similar with you know Nazism and now you can go to the next slide so perhaps what we need is not yes Nazism no Nazism but rather a Nazi countdown clock okay because I, I don't think there's anyone here that will deny it. we're not in 1945 we're not in 1944 there's no death camps there's no concentration camps there's no gas chambers there's no crematoria Okay, so we're not there, okay? We're not at that level of genocide. But are we in 1941? Are we in 1940? Are we in 1939? There's benchmarks along the way with which we can measure. Are we at the point where we put a stamp on the passport of every Jewish person, the J stamp? Are we at the point of Kristallnacht? 
at the, we at the point where, you know, and so there's various stages along the way. Nazism did not occur one day. The genocides did not occur from one day to the next. There was a long process of ramping up racism and step by step by step, uh, the space with which Jewish people and other minorities in Germany could occupy shrunk and over time eventually led to the, you know, the, the decimation of the Jewish people in Europe. Um, we're not in 1945, but we're somewhere, everyone is somewhere on that, on that Nazi countdown clock, and maybe this can provide us with some kind of language um, to understand, to reinforce for us that things in Israel are horrific, and that they're getting worse, and they could get much worse, and we don't want to wait till we get to that point. If I was the only person speaking of this, that'd be one thing. But just last year, on Holocaust Remembrance Day, it wasn't just David Sheen. It was Yair Golan, the deputy chief of the Israeli army, who said, if there's something that frightens me about Holocaust Remembrance, it's the recognition of the revolting processes that occurred in Germany 70 years ago and finding signs of them among us today in 2016. So this is coming from the deputy chief of the Israeli army and actually a top candidate to become the next chief of the Israeli army. Now, in the United States, this is their Nazism, right? Just as the Nazis were the white supremacists of the European continent, the KKK are the Nazis of the American continent. And here we have American magazines openly comparing Trump to the KKK, associating him with the KKK, unabashedly. I think we can agree that Netanyahu has done far more damage than Trump, although admittedly Trump is the, is, commands a much larger army, but Netanyahu has been in power for far longer and has gotten away with a, with a good deal. But Trump, even German magazines, can compare him to the KKK and even make allusions to Nazism, to Hitler himself, okay? Um, Time Magazine can talk about Nazism in America, but when Time Magazine talks about Benjamin Netanyahu, this is how they frame him, King Bibi. So obviously there's a huge disparity between what we're allowed to say about even an American president and what we're allowed to say about an Israeli prime minister. So um, this is the last uh, little piece before we break, but I wanted to just give you one last um, segment that may help you understand how we can talk about Netanyahu. To go, at, we're gonna we're, to understand, we're gonna have to go to New York, but not New York of today, but rather New York of a hundred years ago. So at that time, um, many people here may not know this, but there was tremendous tremendous poverty at that time. People living in horrific conditions. Um, and not only were people living, and were you know, adult Americans living in these conditions, but sadly, um, even children. There was a massive child homelessness problem, if you can imagine this, in the streets of New York City 100 years ago. Horrific. And in this context, of poverty, you, you, you know, these are some of the fashions at that time, and um, in the garment industry that at that point hadn't really been exported to the third world yet, so-called third world, um, in New York City is where a lot of the sweatshops were, where some of these fashions were sewn, uh, often by immigrant women, uh, mainly Italian women and Jewish women, Eastern European Jewish women, Jewish immigrants and Italian immigrants, and uh, these are some of the women that uh, worked in that field and a hundred years ago, very sadly, there was a fire in one of these buildings uh, and we, we're not really sure how it broke out. Maybe someone was smoking a cigarette, but in any case, it just ripped through the entire building. And I mean, it was, it, 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 it really was something that was, uh, Horrific in the sense that, you know, the entire building was gutted. And I'm going to show you some very disturbing photos right now. I just want to prepare you. You may want to look away. Um, 
not only was the place itself guarded, but you can imagine for the women who were there, um, they had no choice but to jump out the windows because the owner of the factory, you know, had locked the doors and didn't provide fire escapes that were operable. So when the fire broke out, these women were not able to escape and climb down the fire escapes and the landings. And so these women had no choice. As the place began to fill up with flames, they actually threw themselves out the windows. And you had bodies and bodies of women just you know, littering the ground, even like falling through the ground into the basements below. The, the streets were just covered, like 150 women and girls died this way on one day. And um, of course, it, it, it ripped through the immigrant community of New York City. Um, it was a very difficult moment. But afterwards, what was interesting was that those women, uh, their sisters, you know, and their, their comrades decided that there had to be an end to this, that they had to fight for their rights, that they were being exploited, and they were going to stand up and protest in the streets and demand better working conditions. And it's thanks to women like these that we have some measures in place today for working women and working men and because of this struggle. Now, if you notice some of the photos from these protests after the death of these 150 women, you see, as I said, a lot of these women who died were Jewish immigrants. We mourn our loss, United Hebrew Trades of New York. Um, what's interesting about this photo is they're standing in the street in front of this storefront. Uh, it says in Yiddish, uh, at the time, um, you know, big, as I said, Jewish, Eastern European Jewish immigrant. Um, and, and so this is actually the uh, offices of a Yiddish newspaper in New York City, the, the Groysa Kundel. And so here's a, here's a copy of one of their newspapers. And you see on the front page, uh, in response to this horrific uh, incident, they actually published this cartoon, this political cartoon. And here you have the overseer, the owner of the sweatshop, working with a whip and the, the people themselves, you know, slaving away with holes in their clothes and sweating and creating clothes for the master. And on the other side, you have uh, an image of the Pharaoh of Egypt, you know, the historical oppressor of the Jewish people. And he says in Yiddish, I've translated it into English, Jews once worked for me in Egypt, but never like that. Okay, so what's happening here? So, and keep in mind, this is in the 1910s. So this is before the Holocaust, okay? In the post-Holocaust era, Adolf Hitler, the Nazi party, they are considered, you know, the worst enemies ever, the greatest oppressors of the Jewish people, the, the hands down. There's no comparison. But pre-Holocaust, Pharaoh of Egypt is the historical arch enemy of the Jewish people. He, just as the KKK are the Nazis of America, he was the Nazi of Jewish lore. He was the, the, the ultimate evil of Jewish history. And so what this cartoon is saying, what this Jewish newspaper is saying, and their front page cartoon is, as bad as the Pharaoh of Egypt was, as cruelly as he oppressed the Jewish people, the owners of these sweatshops are even crueler. They are even worse than the Hitler of their time. And the owner of that sweatshop, the owners of that very sweatshop where all these women died, they themselves were Jews. Okay? Yes, many of the women who died there were Jews, and the owners were Jews as well. And so what this Jewish newspaper was saying was, you were worse than Hitler of our time. The Hitler of that time, you're worse than them. So the Jewish community of that time and the Jewish left of that time did not hesitate to criticize the paragons, you know, the, the captains of industry, the leaders of their own community were not exempt from the most harsh criticism that they could express in Jewish terms. Okay? Today it's Hitler, then it was Pharaoh, and they did not spare them the most harsh criticism. And we need to reclaim that. We need to reclaim the right to make the harshest criticism. With respect, with the tip of the hat, 
to the Jewish cartoonists who are speaking truth to power. I showed you a comic from 100 years ago. I'll show you a comic from our present day. My friend and colleague, Ellie Valley, he drew a cartoon a couple years ago called Hater in the Sky about the relationship between Obama and Netanyahu. So according to this, uh, this, this cartoon, he uh, has, you know, it's obviously an exaggeration. He has Netanyahu claiming that the settlements are being threatened and the only thing that can protect them is a space laser gun that will defend them from space. So Obama wants to appease Netanyahu and do everything he can to help, you know, even if it's the settlements. So, all right, I will go there to, into space. You're going to shoot me into space and I will install this ray gun myself. That's the premise of the cartoon. So, and a, a BB goes to help him. He's like, I want to make sure you do it right. So they go into space. Soon in outer space, to install the ray gun, Netanyahu says, I'm starving to death here, Barak. What do you mean, Netanyahu? We have enough rations to last years in the spaceship. <gasps> Barry, if you don't let me lead you, if you don't let me eat your limbs, I might pass out and die. Next scene. <laughs> He's actually gone ahead. Obama has conceded and allowed Netanyahu to eat his limbs turn him into a paraplegic. Well, it's hard to install the ray gun now, but I don't want to jeopardize our special relationship. You think it's over? Not quite. Barack, we're all alone up here, and I have needs. <laughs> what? <gasps> yes. You going there, huh? You, you what? Do I have to spell it out, Barry? Twelve minutes later, <laughs> Netanyahu chilling like a villain and Barack Obama just, you know, traumatized by the whole thing. I just want this to end. So this is what we've come to. We've come to the point where as horrific as things are in Israel, as gruesome as they get, um, any criticism is criticized any efforts even by Jews and Jewish Israelis like myself to confront the government you know are, are, are the, the, the tools are taken from us we aren't allowed to criticize and certainly if we're disgusted enough to compare Netanyahu to our worst oppressors we're told we can't do so whether we use a countdown clock or any other method so this is what you've done by taking away from us the ability to criticize what you've done. is you say you can't call Netanyahu a Nazi, okay, that may be the case. He's not Hitler. But by limiting the discourse to such an extent, you've made it so that we have, all we can do is say, no, okay, Netanyahu's not a Nazi, so he eats and rapes black men. This is what you've come to. You've said it, so we, we, we can't compare him to Hitler, but we can compare him to Jeffrey Dahmer. So this is what we've come to, just as a hater in the sky. But we're not haters in the sky, okay? We are lovers on the ground. When we criticize it, it's because we do it from a place of love, because we love the land and we love the people and we are sick and tired of living this way. We're not willing to let the supremacists win the day.